and um, there was uh, a uh, uh, a lady that was uh, her name was Evelyn Blackshaw, and she was a, a cohort of Jean Adriel. So Jean, she's living Evelyn's living on the West Coast, and and Baba comes to uh, America in 1931, and Jean contacts Evelyn, and Evelyn as a young lady hitchhiked across the United States during the Depression to go meet Bobbo. So, anyway, she was a very interesting, lovely lady. And I, I, was, I remembered that uh, during that time, Jean Adriel was living in Los Angeles, and she had gone into kind of seclusion and was not really part of anything. And Evelyn gave me her number, and I called Jean up and you know, said, we're, you know, explain, we're we contacting everybody, would you like to come to the meetings? No. Can we come see you and talk to you? No. Um, I'm happy you're buying my book, but I don't want to see anybody. And you know, she died 10 years later, just living by herself in Los Angeles, so she wouldn't, she wouldn't meet anybody. And then probably the two most interesting characters, of course, was Hilda Fuchs, whose chair you have over there. And who, um, uh, when we met her, um, she showed us the chair and we asked her if we could borrow it. It was in the Mayor Papa bookstore for years. And no, he, no adult ever sat in it, but all the babies got to get put on it. They all would. Oh, yeah. So anyway, um, Bridget found some pictures. Um, so anyway, the... Um, Hilda told the story of uh, she had she was living in Germany and she had uh, and she had uh, uh, been known known a mayor Baba and so they during uh, close to the close to when um, the World War II started. Uh, she knew as Jewish person and the Jewish family, she had to get the heck out of Dodge, so to speak. And so they had prepared. Yes. Yes. That's yes. She's 42 this year. Um, so Hilda had, the family was ready to go. I think she had two children and uh, the husband. And they had their money and their passport. And they were ready to leave, and on the door knocks, and in comes the SS. And they come in, and they search the house. They think something's up. They look under the beds, and they look here, and they look everywhere. And they're like, okay, they find nothing. And so they leave. But... On the mantle, above the fireplace in the living room, is all their money, all their passports, sitting right there in plain sight. Except there's a Mayor Baba picture on top of it. So, Baba saved their lives. Anyway, and the last and the craziest guy of all was Dana Field. So I said, go, go find Dana. And we came to Dana's house, and it was a little room, and we walk in, and the bed, the table, the chairs, the countertop, and the floors are full of Baba pictures, just laid all over the place. You had a little walkway you could do like that and into the spot. And Dana was uh, working at a job. He Many years ago he was a college professor, but his daughter died in a flash flood and he kind of, he could never do it again. And Dana was, if you ever got a letter from Dana, it was handwritten in this very wild script that would be like 10 pages long. I almost couldn't read it to him. But Dana was this lovely, darling man that loved Baba very much, um, was always sort of getting in trouble. 
by his own design and had um, you know was there with went to Myrtle Beach met Melvin Myrtle Beach went to the to the uh, the two incredible weeks of men's meeting went to um, uh, the East West gathering and went to the last Darshan and Dana was always full of good stories and in love being in coming to the meetings and stuff because it was just there was this wonderful life and he had missed it for so long because he was from the 60s on he basically retired to the soul room by himself so that was uh, the, uh, you know Dana came and some more than Dana did but Dana came the most in the different meetings and then because he was living out in this area when the Pasadena store first opened he came he was over there too and that was uh, so we met all these wild characters that were in in Baba's uh, circle and realm, but at the same time, um, and this gets more personal, is the fact that Baba was uh, bringing into his their their awareness his presence to his what I call his old new lovers. They were the people that were. Um, had been with him for ages and ages and ages, but hadn't met him in the physical body in this lifetime. And they were who Baba called his gems. And he told the Mondali, you know, when you see these young people coming from the West, you are just not going to believe how much love they have for me. Uh, it's going to just blow your socks off. And they, um, the Mondali couldn't understand that. They, you know that was a whole different deal, but um, it's it is the um, it's what he wanted, and um, Sri Aurobindo writes about these people. Uh, I you read Savitra? It's Aurobindo's tome. You too. What is a thousand pages or something like that? All in, in perfect, perfect balance. Um, he calls these these people the golden-eyed children, who uh, come down the inner plains, bringing the new humanity. So he say, "Who are these golden-eyed children?" Look around. That's who they are. So we're not a bunch of duds. <laughs> Although we may feel like it. You see, I always thought that, that uh, especially going to Darshan in 69, that Baba was kind to us to not have met his physical form. I'm still kind of pissed because he dropped the body 69 days before we went to India. He was good. But the way the older lovers that had met him in his body, which was so dramatic, they when they reacted when Baba dropped the body, they got really pissed off. Uh, one person I know that had been with Baba since the 30s, she just turned all of Baba's pictures on the wall to the wall. She was so mad at him because he left before she did. And when we were with met the Mondali, here we were the first Westerners there since the 1962. Baba's not there. They don't know what to do. One, one afternoon at the Darshan, the most important event in our life, Eric was up there saying, somebody left this pen. Has anybody recognized this pen? And he did lost and found for a whole morning. And it was, we, you know, we said, well, well, now what for these guys? To Eric and to Adi and to Jal and to uh, uh, the different, you know, Padre and Pendu and all that. And they were like, we don't know what to do. Uh, maybe we'll go back into business. Eric says, yes, I'm an engineer. Maybe I'll go and be an engineer again. They thought that was it. Baba dropped the body. Okay, we were just excused. Or oh, we're going to die soon. And they didn't realize what kind of a role he had for them for all these years, which was to bring life to 
to uh, uh, Baba's life and his, his presence of love to us who had met him. On the other hand, I think that part of Baba's plan was to not meet him in the body for us because um, that way we met him in our hearts. And it's a lot easier to carry a Baba around like that than to think about the, the image of his body. So anyway, we lucked out. So uh, Adarshan gets, gets called and everybody's all excited. And people are starting to go to work and working three jobs and trying to save six hundred and eighteen dollars for the trip, and uh, now it's what around three thousand. And um, so this is a story about Mayor Bob and the FBI. So uh, one day, one afternoon, this young man walks into the Mayor Baba bookstore in Venice. He's a nice, good-looking guy, short hair and everything, and he introduces himself, and he turns out that he's a Marine at Camp Pendleton. And, you know, this was like during in 1968, the Vietnam War was going on, and it was this and that. And he was just smitten with Baba, and he had heard about him, he read about him, he saw the Mayor Baba books, and he had to come in. And so he said, oh, this, I said, boy, are you lucky? We just heard that Baba's having Darshan, and we're all going. Do you want to come along? And he went, yes. So I gave him the detail and the dates and everything else. And so he said, so he, the first thing he did was go back to uh, the base and he put in for a leave. And the, and the, uh, his commanding officer said, oh, okay, you got this leave coming. What's it for? I'm going to India. You're going to India? Yes. Do uh, you have relatives in India? No. I'm going to go see my spiritual master, Mayor Bobby. He's having darshan in India. <laughs> now, we didn't know that this guy had a really high security clearance and he was somebody that listened in on the Chinese and their nefarious plans, especially that had to do with Southeast Asia. So he was pretty high up there in, in security clearance. So I didn't know that he said this to his, his commanding officer. But one afternoon, to gentlemen in nice suits and everything walk in and I'm sitting there, hey, how you doing? And he says, hello, is this Mayor Bob Bookstore? Yes. And they just pulled out and there's their FBI badges. We're from the FBI. I'm thinking, okay, was it that traffic light I ran? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, well, we understand that uh, this is a, 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 a a store, a bookstore, and the area of dissemination for a Mayur Baba, a, who is, says he is an Indian guru. And I said, yeah. And they said, okay, well, uh, what's this all about? And I was a little bullish. I said, why are you asking? And they told me this guy, Marine, had put in for leave, and so they had to come and check it out. So they asked me about this, and I'm telling them about... Baba's life and the seven planes and you know no no drugs and I'm giving hand books to him and pamphlets to him. They had universal messages and they had all kinds of stuff. And then they said, okay, well, is this his his official center in the United States? I said, no, no, no. I said, uh, uh, and I thought, well, okay, it must be Myrtle Beach. So I gave told him, said Myrtle Beach Center, and they said, what's the address? And I flipped around and found it, and. Uh, years later, I found out that they showed up at Myrtle Beach and interviewed Kitty and Elizabeth. And so the guy didn't get to go. But there's a dossier still on Mayor Baba uh, in, uh, in the... No. No. No, it's not Mike Petty Gill. This is another guy. So, no, he, they said no, because his security class was... Yeah, but no, that, I know, Mike, no, this was a different guy. His, he was like right up at the top of that. So anyway, so Bob, the FBI has a dossier on Baba. And other people would come in too after the, after the, they, David, this reminds, you remind me of the story, that after the, uh, after coming back from Darshan, we brought back stuff. There was a harmonium and some tablas and, uh, you know, all kinds of, we were just hot on, just, 
everything Indian and just wearing our Indian clothes around and stuff. You know, <laughs> hadn't got this be in the world but not of it thing quite yet. We're still working on that. And so Lefty and I are in the in the back of the bookstore one evening, and Lefty had made a dulcimer. Remember that dulcimer Lefty had? He would always play it, and he handmade it, and nobody touched it. He mailed a little case for it too, and he would play. He played this sort of impromptu stuff, and it was, it was kind of cool. And so we're sitting back there, and he's just strumming away, and uh, the the door opens, a little bell rings, and I get up and go out, and there's this kind of old middle-aged, short little gentleman in kind of a funny little suit, Indian of origin, and he says, he looks around, says, oh, Maribago Bookstore. And then he hears the music in the back, and there's a, 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 a curtain in between the front and the back. And he just walks past me, pushes the curtain open, walks in, stands over Lefty, who's going, uh, like this. And he looks at this. He says, what is that? Lefty says, oh, dulcimer. And he goes, takes it right out of his hands. And he strums it a little bit. And then he makes a face and he detunes it. And then he's playing. And he's playing a, a, a little Indian music. He tuned it to whatever the, the tuning is for that. And he just whipped off a little tune on it like that. And he goes, gives it back to him. He says, okay, thanks. And he leaves. And Lefty is going, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I got something I can put Indian music on. And he was playing and everything. It was kind of cool. And then so the next night in the evening, the door opens again. And the, that little guy comes in. And his buddy is with him, also an Indian gentleman. And they walk in. And they're saying something to each other in, in whatever the language they were speaking. And I recognized the guy that came in with him. It was Ravi Shankar. And um, the little guy that came in was Alaraka, his top list. So he says, come here, come here, come here. They go in and he grabs Lefty's dulcimer again and he gives it to Ravi Shankar. Ravi Shankar plays a little, ooh, a little fun. And then, um, and then he sees a harmonium. And so he sits down at the harmonium and he just does this little improv, and all the, all the rockers do a little, on the tablas, play it like that. And they had play for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or something like that, and so, um, uh, it's like, wow, we're just Lefty and I are sitting there just with our jaws down. They were, see, they were teaching at UCLA at the time, and so they just came, he walked down the Venice Street one day, and this is the Avenue, and there it was. And so they had fun, and they were laughing about it and stuff. So I said, did you guys ever play for Mayor Baba? And they made this kind of like, oh, God, face. And he says, yes. Every time we went to Bombay, Baba would always invite us to come and play for him. Uh, whether it was in Pune, <coughs> Pune or out at uh, 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 Mayor Zad or whatever. Yeah. And then they, they both kind of go, yeah. And they, and we, of course, were happy to go play for Baba. But, you know, we'd play all evening, and it'd be like two in the morning, and we were done, and Baba would go, oh, just one more, just one more. <laughs> and they say, you know, it'd be dawn, and we were finally finished with Baba's just one more. So they, they played for Baba many times, and it was, uh, it was kind of a fun little little thing we knew about that. So, Baba kicked in that time with a big wave of energy, and it brought people from every place. Uh, at one time we had a mailing list of like 500 people, and we would fill Haynes Hall at UCLA for a talk, like for Alan Cohen or Owen Adi or Mayor G. Kim or anybody. It was just popping every place. And part of that, too, was the fact that here are a bunch of young guys here. We started a consciousness beyond drugs, you know, to mimic what was going on in, 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 in San Francisco and Berkeley. Alan Cohen encouraged us. And we were talking at the colleges and at the high schools and the universities and stuff, not knowing a whole lot of what we were saying, but we were damn enthusiastic about it. And some people kind of was like taken by that and sort of followed us back to <laughs> To the uh, to the bookstore, trying to figure out all this this stuff, and you know we had, you know, Adi and Mayorji came and Ronald came and uh, uh, Sam Carawalla came and 
this very oh yeah she just came in one afternoon sat down in the bookstore told the stories and uh, uh, just anybody that was coming through now this one fellow W.D. Kane he went on a world tour for Baba um, he was the guy he was the secretary to the president of India and the reason he got to go on a world tour he was the he was a he was the uh, uh, chairman of the World Council of Religions. And so every couple of years, he will go around the world to all the leaders of the major religions of the world. He would stop in Arabia, and he would stop in Rome, and he stopped in China and all over. And one year he, um, he in 1970, after everything was people coming and going and all that, he included America in his trip. And he was a very, very forthright and really interesting guy. Some people thought he was kind of crazy, but he was just enthusiastic. He's the guy that, remember Mayor Baba uh, said, pointed to a spot in somebody's house that was the closest on the gross plane to the own point? It's a, you know, a story about that. Baba was visiting, it happened to be Mr. Kane's house. And, you know, it's up there. It's a nice place. It's on the grounds of the, in Delhi, on the grounds of the president's place and stuff. And Baba was leaning back in a chair on the wall, uh, sitting back, kind of kicking back like that. And he said, he went, this is the closest point to the own point. Now, he did like that. Baba did like that. But Cain thought it was the spot on the wall behind him. So, he remembered, and after Bob left, he throw a little nail in there. Then he said, oh, what if the nail falls out? So how would I make this permanent? Oh, so he, he had a window cut, and the very center of the diagonal center of the window was where Bob pointed on the wall. Now, whether it was the wall or not, most I think it was like this, but he thought that was, that was cool. But he went around the world, and one of the things he he did was he talked with all the world leaders about the state of the world and uh, the new age that was coming. And uh, now he'd do things like, anybody here been to St. Mark's Cathedral? Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, as you walk in, from the first big altar in St. Mark's body is buried underneath and, you know, that's, that's a place that Baba said was designed by a perfect master and that he had been there as Jesus sat on the same spot that he sat when he did in 1932, and um, one of the holiest places in in uh, Europe, that and Assisi and uh, Portofino on the Ligurian coast, and um, maybe one other one I forgot. But uh, so th there are these big pillars, 30 feet high, and there's these little hand carved spiral staircases go up, and at the top is a little pulpit, and at times, I think people would give sermons and stuff. But thousands of people are coming in and out with the guys and stuff. He gets inspired and he goes up to the top of one of those and he starts in this big, booming voice, giving a sermon to all these tourists on Mayor Baba. Oh, yeah. It was totally normal for him to do that. And so uh, somebody said, Does the Pope know about Mayor Baba? And he said, Oh, of course. They've known about Baba since, you know, after World War II. And then he says, then the person said, well, why doesn't he tell everybody? You know, that's one of these. He said, you just can't do that now. But it was the, um, the Pope's head all known. All the major religions knew that this was this time and this place. And uh, there were all these funny little pieces that would go along with that. Um, Phyllis Fredericks once tried to uh, uh, interest uh, Bishop Sheen. I don't know if anybody's an old Catholic, but Bishop Sheen was this fiery cardinal, and then well, first was bishop, then cardinal, and he had a TV show. And man, this guy was charismatic, and he talked the gospel in a way that was not dry and dull and in Latin. And he was a he was a personality, and uh, uh, wrote books and. Was a uh, was a real uh, 
push for spiritual spiritual point of view for the Catholic Church. And Phil wrote him a letter and put a Baba picture in with it, telling her, him about Baba. They did it to Eisenhower, got letters about Mayor Baba, and they sent Eisenhower the uh, uh, in the back of the old um, New Humanity, there was a, a part Mayor Baba on war, and it was very complete as to when it was appropriate. Now, they sent that to Eisenhower, and everybody got, there was a big PR move for Baba. And Bishop Sheen got the letter, and then he wrote back to Phil, thank you very much. Uh, uh, what you are claiming is just so ridiculous, I can't believe that you even waste your time. Oh, and by the way, thank you for the picture of our dear Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but you see, Baba is, Baba is the avatar. And... Um, so when I first met Baba, I, I had no problem. Yeah, Baba, you're the avatar. No big deal. I love you very much, but I made a big mistake. So if you haven't made this mistake yet, think well about it. Because then I said, okay, Baba, you're the avatar. I've been waiting for a long time. What do you want of me? Don't do it. <laughs> well, what's his role? He wants everything from you. So, what will happen is that slowly but surely, everything that is a cherished part, a cherished part of you, and things you hate also, he's going to take them away. So, oh, oh, you look like you just know this. You're such a success. Oh, well, you've done that already. You've perfected. You don't need to do any more. Throw you into some new learning. And, oh my God, you have an horrible time with this. And you just sort of come to 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 uh, consolation with all this stuff, bad boss, horrible place, everything else. And just as you're going, I finally got it. Oh, psh, take me put, put it over here. And Baba just strips all these pieces of your little favoriteness that is your personal ego away from you. Till you know, you get kind of thin. So if you can resist saying to Baba, what do you want of me? Do so. If you can't resist, then you just do it. But that's he played. He played for keeps. And Bridget knows this because in uh, the uh, early '60s, I mean late late '60s, early '70s. I can't remember when. Um, Baba decided he was going to he was going to up the ante. So in a very short period of time, um, lots of people get injured. A young lady fell off her horse and broke her tailbone. Uh, one of our companions got bitten badly by a dog. Um, I had cut my chin open while I was surfing. Bridget had a cut on her leg. That, how many stitches? 60 stitches in her leg from surfing. And uh, uh, some other people bang it, bang well, and then it culminated. On Baba plays for keeps. It culminated in the fact that uh, on a trip to Yosemite it was Virginia Patino's um, a camper, and in it was Clive Adams and Virginia and her sister, and a young woman named Laurel and a young woman named Chris. And you would have gone on that trip had Baba not got your leg cut. Uh, on the way back, the camper was pushed over, and the two girls died in the accident in the, in the ensuing fire. And Virginia broke her leg and stuff, but the camper was separated from the, fire, the cab that burned. And Clyde was literally blown out of the cabin, cab of the camper, and was in the hospital for many days. And so, Baba... You know, took a couple a couple people that work was done at that point. I, I, I th it was kind of, you know, okay, <sighs> how fast does one grow up? I was talking about this with somebody. said, so like, you know, okay, here I'm, we're 19, 20 years old, maybe even 17 and 18 hearing about Baba, and you get your life together, you run a business, and you get a home, and sometimes you get married, and you have kids before you're 23, and all this stuff going on. It just was accelerated. But, uh, you know, uh, I remember getting the call from the Iowa Patrol 
telling us that the two girls had dropped their body. And that was, you know, announced that to everybody, and that was all. But the hardest part for a guy who was, what, I was 21 or 22, I had to call both sets of parents and tell them that the daughters, you know, had died. So it was kind of tough. But you know what's good? Is that we had such a beautiful ceremony for them that both parents went away just like, <sighs> they were not distressed anymore. They didn't have their loss. So, anyway, so Bob does play for keeps. Uh, one thing you have to do as a Baba lover is you have to learn to be a good scoundrel. Baba loves scoundrels. And there's all we find ways to be uh, creatively close to him. And um, uh, 1968, uh, John Connor, who's in this is the picture. I'll, I'll let you guys look at the pictures. The reason I'm not passing them out is that I put names with everybody here so you can see. But John Connor and I are sitting there being just sort of bored at the bookstore. And John says, I got an idea. And so we go out in the front of the bookstore and we um, get somebody to get there a little somatic. We took a picture of John and I. He develops it. Um, we buy a very nice Christmas card, even though it's like September, and put the uh, in the Christmas card. Uh, Merry Christmas from your uh, from your lovers in Los Angeles, or from your from the Los Angeles Mayor Baba Bookstore in Venice. And John and I sign our names, and then we put it in an envelope with the picture, and we address it to Adi K. Arani. So. A couple of weeks later, um, Phil Frederick comes over and she is pissed off. She is just, how could you do this? And John and I are going, what? And she said, you weren't supposed to communicate with Baba and you went ahead and did. We went, no, we didn't. Honest. <sighs> We just sent the Christmas card to Adi. She said, yes, I know. She said, and he got the card, and then he showed the card to Baba. And he showed him your pictures. And so Phyllis got up. Phyllis could communicate with Baba as Ivy Duskud and Elizabeth and, and all. And she said, Adi wrote back to her, to Phyllis, saying that uh, uh, he showed the card. Thought he enjoyed the Christmas card, and he showed it to Baba, and Baba thought the card was, was cute, and that he enjoyed seeing the pictures, the picture of his, his young lovers. <laughs> so, good scoundrelly. And so when Phyllis went, she was, after she was pissed off at us, then she went, okay, let's get everybody together. And we're going to take a picture out in front of the bookstore. And we're going to send it to Adi. <laughs> so, they, uh, that's how you be a good scout. So, anyway. Um, so, you know, you look for good opportunities like that. Anyway, uh, so Baba's last work with us was culminated in 1968 in... Uh, at, on silence day and ask us to be silent for that. And then, you know, Baba worked so hard and he was just so everything. Baba really just stopped at that point. If you read what Monty says and what the Mondali said, Baba just stopped everything. He was no more in seclusion. He was no more in fast. He hung out in the garden and he enjoyed their company. And the girls were, the ladies were allowed to mix with the, with the men. The restrictions of the, were, were now, the separation was no longer there. And Baba, you know, they had the, you saw the picture of December of 68 where they bought, they had the wedding and all that fun stuff. And there's a few other ones that he had in that time. And um, if you ever get to see them, there's, you know, it's, it's very cute because here's all the Mondali old. And they're a bunch of, 
you know, crazy guys. Uh, you see, there's one shot where Kakabaria had had a stroke, and the side, one side of his body wasn't working at all. So uh, Pendu comes over to him and starts poking him on that side of the body, and Kaka, who was a real tough little guy, couldn't hit him back. He was going like this, and then they're all laughing about this. You see these little cute little things that, that went on. And so Baba then, at that point in 68, my work is 100% completed to my satisfaction, and you know, that we thank you everybody for helping, and that was it. Oh, one of the uh, one of the things that Baba had us do for a long time, I think it was maybe six months, was say the Master's Prayer every day, aloud. So, being wanting to have a really, make it very special, um, I would go to the back of the bookstore in the, at dawn, and I would uh, open up the little window that was back there. And the bookstore is on, on the street level. And then it drops off and down, there's houses below, and then there's a little uh, uh, alleyway. So I'd open it to the east, the windows in the east, and I'd open it to the east, and I would say, O Palarigar, the preserver and protector of all, just with um, as much feeling as I could say. Not as bad as Harry Kenmore, but I would say with a lot of feeling. I'd just boom it out to the dawn, to the earth. And after doing this for a while, one morning out of the dark, a voice came back. And I listened, and it was a voice saying, that's a nice prayer, dearie, but could you say it a little softer? <laughs> it's from the house below. The, apparently their bedroom was right below. <laughs> I apologize later because they were our neighbors, but I apologize later. But, you know, it's just like, you get, you know, we were, we didn't know what we were doing. We just did it because Baba's, Baba's love was that. That way. Now you see again here today, I don't know, you have to notice that, that again, a big push of energy, uh, more people interested, more exposure. Um, one thing for sure, what have you all felt that life has accelerated? Now, on a mundane level, if you're in that winding process, what are you supposed to do when you wind? You learn a set of of uh, values, one per lifetime. You learn it, you perfect it, you stand by it, you, this is, you are sure this is absolutely 100%, not knowing that next lifetime you will be exactly the opposite and decline it as false. But you learn that. And then close to when you're ready to drop the body, then you start to go, oh, this is the lessons I learned. And sure enough, you drop the body and then you go in the afterlife and you do you learn it more, only to come back on the opposite side because learning is circular. It's not a piece of the pie, it's the whole pie. So but for people now you hear about, oh yeah, I got laid off my job of thirty years and now I had to get training and start a new job. It's horrible. Well, it's horrible and hard if you're whining because you're not used to having to do two major learnings in any one lifetime. It's tough. And so people squirm about that. And they're like, God, my God, what am I doing? This is sucks. And they blame everything except Baba, who should be blamed for it. You know, for us who are a little more flexible in this process, who've lived a little more, you know, we have begun to uh, process and have retrospect our life learning while we're still in the body. So we go through some. This is what he talked about unwinding some scars. Two things Baba will be known for in history. His work with the advanced souls in the must. Never before like that. And he needed them all to gather the energy, not just for World War II, but for beyond that, to bring in the new humanity. And he was the first spiritual figure that talked about sanskaras, winding, unwinding the sanskaras, to general, you can read it in, the, in, the, in God Speaks or in the Discourses. Read the Discourses, folks. That's, you know, whew. because it answers every question about how, to, how they're unwound. 
what's the role of a, of, a, of, a, of a guru with that as opposed to what's the role of the avatar with that. Read all of that stuff because it really gets you right into what this, the mechanics of are. But in a simple term, so here we are. Assumingly, we've been proved pretty much 8,400,000 lives. And this Baba kind of indicates that you're with me now because you're pretty mature. I don't know the exact count, but we're pretty mature. And, and as he said, there is a period, a softening up period between finishing the winding of sanskaras and starting the unwinding, which you're not making any new sanskaras. Whew. But you're not winding any of you're not unwinding any of them. So this it's also, guess what? It's known as the psychological period. And boy, are we in the psychological period right now. So that's where that comes from. So here you are, as so as you're not making any new ones, you're not just putting something down in stone only to come back another lifetime and break it down. You are softened up and you start to go, oh, yeah, I'm doing this, and this is... You don't know that it's driven by millions of years and thousands of lifetimes doing that. Now you're experiencing it again, because that's what, sounds, what unwinding sanskaras does, is you experience all of the energy that you are wound up into that. Every time you chop somebody's head off, that made an experience, and it was the energy was coded into your learning. And so you perfected it over and over and over and over again. And, there's, and so then at some point you start to loosen that winding, that thread, and what happens is as you loosen the mortar, those, the energy that you capture then is released. It goes to God. He needs it. You're unburdened by not having to do that anymore. But of course the caveat is that is that when that happens, all of those feelings and thoughts and emotions that you tied into doing it then come through you again. So you experience that rage and that hatred and that uh, envy and the jealousy and also all the nice things too, all compacted and intense. So our lives, what it means, the need for our everyday lives, sometimes we're under a lot of stress. We don't know why. Sometimes we are um, distress seriously. Sometimes you're going, Baba, what are you doing to me? I can't walk. I hardly can hold the job down. My family thinks I'm crazy and I have a craving for hot peppers. What's all that about? This is part of that getting loosening things up. It's not very neat. Winding is very neat. Or this one, or that one. Or this group, or that group. It's Oh, you know, you're drawing stuff and it's coming out and stuff. But this is what he's why our lives are a little hectic sometimes, why they seem a little crazy, why they are not well organized inside of us, although most of the time they look well organized on the outside. You have to get along with the world. This is Baba's ne next big wave. Whoosh. Tidal waves getting the tsunamis getting us right now. Boom, bam, crash, bang. We're pushing us around. And you know, if you if you go in the ocean and the waves are big, they can beat the heck out of you. Or you can just go surfing. So, so that's you know, that's that is what his job is right now. That's what he's doing with us right now. And it's in preparation for doing the work of the new humanity. So in for the next six hundred years, we're all gonna be seeing each other's faces. On and off. We'll look a little different, but we're all going to know each other. We're all going to be involved in the same stuff. And whether it's something like this, or whether it's just very private, we're all going to be working for him and taking that that role until the new humanity is set in place. I read so just by as a little note about when Baba comes back. I read something somebody said Baba's going to be a Japanese scientist next like in the next advent. No. Uh uh. They they tied two things together. One, the, the, the guy, Hidashi, Hidashi, I think it was his name, who went to the uh, men's gathering in 54. He took tramp steamers and then showed up unexpected. He begged Baba to come to, to Japan this lifetime. And Baba said, no. But I promise I'll go next lifetime. Then, at another time, 
someone asked Baba, what, uh, what, uh, you know, how will we recognize you, Baba? What's your, your task? And he said, well, I'll be a scientist. So, I'll be a scientist. So, he's not going to be a Japanese scientist. He's <laughs> just going to visit Japan. Uh, so, just to, to clear that stuff up. Uh, just a real quick word before uh, on the importance of visiting and going, getting a chance to go to Baba Samadhi in India, uh, if one can in this lifetime. I know you uh, and I both experienced uh, the trials and tribulations of getting to da that darshan. First of all, okay, Baba's got everybody ready. We're collecting our money. Uh, you were working three jobs at one time. I was probably working two. We had we were you know, had ex living cramming everybody together in living spaces so they wouldn't have to spend so much money eating peanut butter sandwiches you know, three times a day so you didn't spend anything doing all this stuff to get enough money by a certain, by some time in November, borrowing from relatives, doing everything so that you could put your money in. And we all got that together. And so then, we're just happily waiting for that flight to go to India and see Baba, oh yeah! And then I'm, January 31st comes the message, comes the phone call, and he dropped his body. And so, for a lot of people, it was incredibly devastating. For some people, it's like, okay, what's next? And Baba was really saying, trust me. Because he made it clear that he didn't, wasn't going to cancel the darshan. And so the monitor he went, well, Baba's not here, but he didn't cancel the darshan, so you can come if you want to. That's kind of their attitude about it. And uh, people like Marcia Deuce and Elizabeth Patterson and uh, Harry Kenmore in New York said, it's important to go. And so uh, some people dropped out. There was a flight that was, uh, that was completely dispersed because enough people dropped off. Some people went with the Sufi group. Some people went with the New York group. Some people went with the, with the uh, Myrtle Beach group. We were all spread out. It was people from the Western United States. L.A., um, uh, Santa Barbara, Berkeley, Oakland, uh, Seattle, uh, Arizona, Nevada. They were all coming together and then it got broken up and people got pushed in all different places and stuff. But um, <sighs> Baba just upped the ante. He says, oh, are you really my real lovers or not? Because this is our show's for only my real lovers, okay? No newbies. So... How do you prove you're the real lover? Oh, you trust that you're going to have Darshan even though I'm not there. For a bunch of young kids, uh, that was a big leap to do that. And a big test of one's real resolve. But when we got there, and the Mongoli started to get into what we were doing, and the music we sang, and the way we acted, and the love we showed, they went, oh, Baba said this was going to happen. Now we understand, and it really saved them, a lot of them, from just being melancholic about this. The women were just devastated. My hero was, Moni told me that she, from when Baba was, was entombed till then, when the Darshan started, she was, just cried constantly, and they could not console her. And some of the other women were like that too. And then here they come, singing songs, and uh, and there's silly skits and young people sitting with the women sitting with the women one night and the men sitting with the men one night and all this good stuff. And they kind of got joy back. And the, we think, Baba, he's giving us our, his darshan through you. Uh, we were pretty dumb and we were like, huh? <laughs> we didn't know. We do now. But you see, if you can go to the samadhi, that's, that's Baba's charge there on earth. That spot. At the time we went, it was Guru Prasad. And we went out to the tomb, and it was like, okay, there's a tomb. There's, you know, there was just the dirt was still on, on, uh, on Baba's, the little, you know, piece of sort of top piece that there was no marble step and all this stuff that had been repainted. There was still boxes and, uh, and bushels of garlands of the uh, spent flowers that had been on Baba's body. Uh, the uh, the uh, water tower 
uh, you know, there was not a no touch thing. You could put your face, I remember putting my face on Baba's pink coat. It's not even the flowers. And it was, you know, there's Muhammad. He's having a field day because everybody's there with oranges and chocolate bars. It was a long bus ride out, it was a long bus ride back because that's where Baba was then. Now it's shifted and he's at a samadhi. Although I have to tell you, when I went to India in 87, I was like, look at the little Guru Prasad Memorial, it was this, the, you know, the portico in a little tiny room. And I was like, man, this is not going to have it. Because we remember walking down the, the uh, Crush Walk walkway, past the uh, fountain and up the stairs and the end and all that. It was just magnanimous. But when my feet hit the stones, it was like, charge is still there. It was truly, truly the, uh, the charge is still there. But so if you can go to, to India and go to his samadhi, it's not just a field trip. It's really where you, 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 you get what Baba, only thing Baba gives. But be careful, because the only thing Baba ever dealt with was transformational energy. So if you go there, or you get in that high spiritual atmosphere, guess what happens to you? You're going to be transformed. Now some people, it's just wonderful and easy. Other people come home and they go, I hate my family. I hate my job. I even hate myself when I look in the mirror. My clothes don't fit me right. My hair is wrong. I want to go to Uzbekistan. I don't know why. <laughs> And nothing fits. And then slow, and then you go through crisis, and then slowly the new part. Remember I said, Baba takes the energy out of your sun scars out of you. Then you go, some of you come to, okay, I've got a nice provisional ego. I can go back to work. Uh, these people are okay. Uh, yeah, I'll buy some clothes. And everything's sort of back. You're normal, although you're not ever normal again. You're normal in that way. So Baba can use you. So if you can do it, go. If you can't go, you know, read everything that Baba has. How many times are you supposed to read God Speaks? Who knows which? I heard seven. Phil's told us seven. Okay. Uh, the ten came from a guy who was uh, uh, in, here in L.A. during that time. He said, if you read God Speaks ten times, you'll be uh, uh, God realized. He was sure of that. And he, so he almost did like speed reading of that. Yeah. It was, it was Billy Gray. Okay. Billy Gray said that. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay, so does somebody like going the Atma and the Jivatma in the beginningless beginning? What happens if you have to like, go to the bathroom or something? You yeah, like, but aren't you supposed to hear it? Otherwise, it doesn't count if you don't hear it. If you have to use the bathroom or you need a coffee or something, and you I miss chapter three, page seventy-seven, doesn't that not count? You have to start all over. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's like um, beyond, beyond energy. <laughs> the beyond, beyond. It's, well, it's not mental, and it's not sweet, and it's not. All right. Now, God speaks is really much easier to read today. The new format's a lot easier. You remember how hard it was to read the old God speaks? It just went on forever. The type was small, and you see what Baba did is he the, the concept. Here's the concept. Next paragraph. Here's the concept. Next paragraph. Here's the concept. Maybe three, four, five times on one page. And you would go, What the hell? Why do I, I'm tired of reading about this. hurt my brain. I finally figured it out that Baba would say it on one level. And if you didn't get it, he would dumb it down a little bit. And then dumb it down a little more. I usually got it about fourth or fifth time. It was simpler and simpler and simpler until you got the concept. So the book is very hard to read, and the new, new formatting is kind of com 
put together a little bit. I think we got more advanced. Is why we can understand it better. But if you, you know, that is that. If you don't know the, that gives you the spiritual dictionary and vocabulary, and then the discourses give you the the, the framework of how when you're going through these things, how you're supposed to look at. It. Although it's very much written for the Eastern world, so don't try all the meditations. They just don't work. And when there's certain things in there that are kind of like, what the heck is he talking about? And it's true, it's mostly for the Easterners in some sections. So you read it, you get something out of it, but it's something that you can really practice, uh, you know, different disciplines. And, you know, then the different books, like God, uh, The God-Man, uh, all of the different ones, gives you the flavor, because this is, this is where you link with them now. Otherwise, you've got to wait 600 years to link again. It's a long, lonely time. Good. Congratulations. Yeah. So this is, you know, this is this is our pilgrimage to do that, and someday it's going to be a you know a big thing, and you got to have your e coupon to go in and all that stuff. Yes, I'm going to. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, no, no, it was. It, 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 you mean God speaks? No, God, Bob. When that was done, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, question mark for um, Mercer Deuce and Don Stevens was where some commas went, because Bob had just wrote without punctuation. And they said their hardest part was to put the, the punctuation. Very, very little of the actual text was ever changed. And Baba reread everything to make sure it was to his liking. So this was this this is why this is more his than the discourses, which were C D Deshmuk gathering stuff from all over the place. Kind of Bob would say, which we write, expand upon that. Deshmukh being the scholar, or would we expand upon it? And so it has, you can tell there's different flavors to that. But God speaks, that is not, that's not anything but Baba's work, writing and approved by him. Every chapter was sent, and he would make corrections and send it back to, uh, to Ivy and Don. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I, I definitely qualify with the not understanding it part, but it does give you your spiritual vocabulary. And if you don't have that, it's really it's really tough to identify. So this is you know this is this is this is your your study piece. So you get that and you look at that chart. Bob didn't put this all out here for nothing. It wasn't the avatar of uh, photography and spiritual works that were in, written in English, no less, and with, with such detail. These are secrets that just, you know, there were times if you told something about these different things, you, were, you could get, get killed very easily if you were caught telling these secrets out of, or you at least get kicked out of their group. So, yeah, the supplement's good. You know, I always, I always had trouble with the nerval couple samadhi state, but I never had trouble understanding the the baka and the fana. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, so that was that. Bob was, no, God speaks definitely was is his, and uh, has other than some. I remember Mercia said that it was that this was a sacred charge that they they would. Uh, Don and Mershida would fuss for days over whether Baba meant to have a pause here and you put a comma in or not. That was how detailed it was. It wasn't changing the wording. It was beautiful. It was lyric. But, you know, did Baba want us to break it here or did he want a period here? And this was just, that was, that was their, their task. And then to typeset it so Baba could see it. So. And since we don't get to see Baba's book, although I'm told that Amandali said that about 90% of what was in Baba's 
secret book is in God Speaks. So we're not missing too much. And I don't know if Baba was just playing with people when he said, you know, you read one page of this, you'll go blind. <laughs> and made him carry it around. Oh, so the funny story about Dana, it reminded me, you know, Baba made the manuscripts carried around in a metal box on a chain and a monster model. You had to carry it around on their neck to not lose it. So Dana feels in his funny way um, decides that he was going to go to India for the last darshan, and uh, his 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 enthusiastic advertisement of where he was going also became his um, somewhat of his undoing of the of his of his pride in what he was doing. And what he was doing is that he took a an eight by ten photograph of Mayor Baba, put it in a metal frame with a glass in front of it tied a piece of rope around it, and he wore it around his neck. Now, you know, we were wearing Baba pendants and stuff like that, and he had this <laughs> all the way to, to Japan, in Japan, back on the flight to Hong Kong, back on the flight to Thailand, into Mumbai, getting on the, on the bus. Dana had clackety-clackety-clack his picture. And he was like, you know, people would look at it and he said, um, this is okay. See, my people are being seen Baba's picture, so it's okay I wear this and look ridiculous. And he didn't say the ridiculous part, but he did look ridiculous. But he was like proud of this stuff. So we get to Pune, we get off the bus, Jalavani is there to meet us. It's such a crazed time that we don't know whether it's morning or night at that point. And um, Dana uh, bows down to the land of India. And he bows down, and as he bows down, somehow that pitcher flips up in the air, smacks him right in the face, and chips a tooth. He's got a little blood on there. And Dana thought about it a while, and towards the end of the trip he said, he wasn't wearing his picture anymore, he says, I realized what happened. I was like proud of this. And Baba showed me that. I was, that was a little, little much to be proud of something like that. So he gave me a whack on, on the lip. And that's how Dana looked at it. So he was a very interesting dude on that. So, well, Yargis, uh, we have a minute or two left. Do you have anything you want to tell about those old days? Any remembrances of yours? Yes, a one young lady who was only like 17 at the time her dad was a doctor. She says, Daddy, I'm going to India. He says, not unless you get shots. And she said, but I have lots of friends. Okay, we'll give them shots too. And this guy, this doctor with no association with us came in and, you know, <laughs> next week, <laughs> gives everything that we needed to get there. And, you know, those were, that was when you know, we went, got into the hotel, the Gulmore. I was in the Gulmore Hotel. She was lucky. She went to the Puna Club, which was Duncan had a, a, a membership of the Puna Club. And they were this little bungalow, and it was beautiful. The racetrack was up there, and they had these delicious meals, and they had little bananas and stuff coming to them in the morning for their breakfast treat and stuff. We were in the Gulmore Hotel, and noted for... Uh, two things. One was that it was the, the area for all the birds of prey that lived in town because there was, out, out of town there was a Parsi, Parsi Tower of Silence. And so I was up at dawn, I'm sitting there on the third three-story building, sitting there relaxing, thinking about Bob, and all of a sudden this giant dark shadow <laughs> goes right in front of me down and then turns and goes down the street it was a big vulture. Vultures and hawks and eagles all lived up on top, and they would just drop, and off they went to, for breakfast. And the other thing was that was that was notable about that was that the in the courtyard there was a well, and in the well was this turtle, and the poor turtle trapped in the well. Although he looked like he had plenty to eat because the 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 green crud on top of the water was so thick, the turtle kind of walked 
on the green crud. He couldn't swim very well. And we were sitting out there and we looked in. Oh, look at that funny turtle in that old well. And then we noticed there was a pipe coming up from the side of the well. And it went over and went down and it went across the driveway and right into the kitchen. So, so this is when you walked into your room and you threw two Halzone tablets in the pitcher of water and you never got your money water in your mouth when you're taking a bath, a shower, teeth. None of that couldn't do it with that. And, uh, the, you know, the one, it rained at Darshan one day. It was elephant rain. It just hurt. It was so bad. Well, we loved it. We danced in it. And then, of course, it washes all the stuff on the side of the river into the river. And the river was the water supply. And right after that, lots of people got sick. And they had to get a, uh, a sicky bus that was air conditioned to go out to Baba's tomb. Everybody else rode in the you know those red buses you see driving along in India with a little with a little steel rail and that that's where we got to ride to from Bombay to Pune and then from Pune out there that's the only buses available. So and we were you on the bus that we had to push up the hill? Yes. So on the on the last on the last bus out, uh, Mayor G was on it, Lud Dimple, and all of the pregnant women that were on the trip were all on the bus. And this guy's going, 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 you know, and then he gets to the gap, starts going up the gaps, and going this way, going like this, and this, and then he finally gets to the one spot. I saw it in the daylight in 1987. I'm really glad I didn't see it in 1969 at two in the morning. He turns the corner and starts going up. This bus had, didn't have first gear, so it's grinding. He starts to go back. So his two guys get out and they put big rocks under the back wheels. Goes over the rocks, goes back and smacks against the back side of a boulder. Now, I looked in 1987, and just a few feet from where that bus smacked was a 100-foot drop. And there were carcasses of buses and trucks down there that had gone off. So the guy says, all right, everybody, get off the bus and push me up the hill. This is along, it's about a mile up. You know that one term where you go, up, 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 yeah, that's it. And so the, everybody got out, the pregnant lady and everybody else, the guys all pushed this crappy old bus and pushed it, pushed it, pushed it, pushed it, pushed it. Finally, he got going towards the top and stopped at the top, and we all marched up at 2 in the morning along the side of the road with the trucks and buses coming up and down, got up, got in the bus, and yeah, this is Baba's Darshan, it's okay. We got up and went on our merry way. So it was, uh, it was a... Uh, Hey, Yorgos, there's a p your picture with you in there. Anyway, so I don't know if anybody has any questions. I think I've said everything. Yes. Oh, I'd love to. There's lots of stuff. Oh, yes. Not for the first one. It was, see, Amartithi was, it was kind of funny because it was, uh, it took on a funny life as far as I was. The first time when uh, that they celebrated, the year after, it was sort of like, more like a, not a celebration, but it was more like a, you know, what you would do when you were going and honor the one that, that died. It was very somber. And not very celebrational, and it grew into the celebration. But the time, by the time it grew into the celebration, I was thinking, three thousand people coming. There's no uh, pilgrim center. There's nothing there. Uh, you get a bucket of water for a shower, and uh, you sleep on the ground, and hopefully it's not wet. And I was going, nah, I don't think so. I, I passed on going after that, that because it, it was, you know, now with the Pilgrim Center and stuff, it's just wonderful. And did you see yourself, Yargus? No. Your name is, you got to look on there, open it up, and there's the names on the, on the face page. It was the, uh, it was a very wild and beautiful time. Well, that's why we can't judge our roles. Unless you are uh, on the planes and you are un- uh, veiled, you can't really judge 
what you're doing at this moment, but you go on trust that Baba's got the right plan for you. And you're, you're not here by accident. There is no coincidence. Think of every one of you. How did you find, hear that call? Oh, well, it was just an accident, man. Uh-uh. It was well planned. And you can see if you, how far back do you have to go in your life to see you moved from someplace in the Midwest to California. Your parents took a chance. And Bridget's a good example of that. She had to come from Austria to Milwaukee to Southern California to finally, as a young lady, to finally bump into Mayor Baba. That's a big trip. So this is we're not we're not random. We are at we are, are the ones that he needs at this time and place. So what does that mean? We have to start acting like it. We can't run around like a bunch of doofuses. We have to act like we are something that Baba needs. And in doing so, you do his work. You know, you're never going to be perfect. You're always going to mess up. But Jay Baba man.